Okay, I think we're there. Morning, I think there's all of two of you online at the moment. But prob, hopefully we'll get a few more in a moment. Um, yeah, let me know if you're awake. This is gonna be quite bizarre today because it's uh, there's absolutely no feedback obviously doing it in front of a camera. Um, so feel free to ask questions in the comments box down here. Uh, and I'm gonna make a start. So in terms of atomic structure then, this was one of the areas that quite a few of you, uh, I think struggled on when we did the physics one mock. So I'm gonna go through, we're gonna have a look at atomic structure in terms of the history of it. We'll have a look at the alpha scattering diagram and how that works um, and how that led to a change in, I suppose, our theories. I've got a few exam questions we're going to put up as well. So we'll have a look at how they work. Um, the whiteboard you can see in front of you, I'm going to be writing on this. So afterwards, what I'll do is any notes that I take, I will export this out and I'll drop it on a Google Classroom for you to have as well. And if you want extra exam questions, then brilliant. Okay, so the I suppose to start with, um, if we ignore the sort of go back to sort of Greek times, the we sort of come forwards a little bit. The first sort of model of the atom we had was by a guy called uh, John Dalton. Okay, so Dalton came up with the atomic. Well, not as yeah, he came up with the idea that we had atoms. So the term atom just means uncuttable. It's the idea that if you start cutting up um, atoms and particles. Um, if you can't get any smaller, then what we end up with is an atom. And we know it's not quite true now. We know there's a few other bits and pieces um, inside them, which we'll talk about. But otherwise, we've got this term atom, which is uncuttable. Um, after that, we ended up with Thompson. Now, Thompson came up with the plum pudding model. And if I just drop this in. There we go. So Thompson's idea was this plum pudding model. Now, the plum pudding model, to start with, we've got this idea of a sort of a positive charge, and we've got these sort of negative, um, I suppose particles inside. Now, he envisaged it looked a bit like plums and a pudding. Not that I've ever actually had a plum pudding, but you get the idea. Right, let's actually try and spell today, shall we? There we go. Still no one commenting yet. Okay, so we've got the plum pudding model. Um, after that then, there was an experiment done by Rutherford. Now, Rutherford had two scientists working with him called Marsden and Geiger, and Rutherford was sort of overseeing the project. And they did quite a famous experiment called the Alpha Scattering uh, Experiment. Now again, I'm just gonna drop another diagram down. Let's try that one. See if that one's gonna come on, and also I'm gonna put this one down as well. Now these are both diagrams taken from past exam questions. Okay, so this experiment proved that actually the plum pudding model could not be correct, because if you have a look at it, it would struggle to actually get particles through. Now, alpha radiation uh, is actually made is quite a big particle. It's made of four particles or four subatomic particles. We've got two protons and we've got two neutrons. So it's really quite big, and it was being shone or fired at a very very thin piece of gold leaf. And what we noticed, we just change colour. There we go. What we noticed, if you look over this side, is that most of the alpha particles went straight through the gold leaf. Now, the only reason this would happen is if most of the atom was empty space. So the plum pudding model could not be correct. So we've got this idea of empty space. We then found out that actually a significant number got deflected. So this sort of indicated that the nucleus must be positive. Um, and the reason it indicated that is when you look over here at the alpha radiation, neutrons have no charge but the protons have a positive charge. So we're looking at an overall positive charge. And we know that like charges repel. So if like charges repel, um, then actually the nucleus must be positive as well because it was deflecting or repelling the alpha particles that are going through. 
and we ended up with a small number that were actually sort of reflected back and this indicated that most of the mass was in the nucleus so it completely changed this idea um, and with it they actually came up with this model let's just shift all that Okay, came up with this model, which was the nuclear model. Now, if you notice, when we're looking at it, we don't, they haven't really mentioned protons, we don't know about neutrons, we don't know about energy levels at this moment in time. All we know is that the new, um, electrons are orbiting somewhere, they're basically around the outside. We know we have lots of empty space, and most of this is empty space. <coughs> and when we're looking at the nucleus, um, we knew the nucleus was positive and that was about it at this time um, then we came up with Niels Bohr and James Chadwick okay so let me just show you this quickly as we get there so right, I'm running on too many screens so if you see me looking around um, I'm actually running at the moment on uh, three separate monitors, so it's not that I'm actually avoiding looking at the camera. So this is exactly what you need to know for your exams. Um, and this is pretty much what I'm going through at the moment. Okay, so we've got here, and this is all you really need to know about Niels Bohr. We don't need to know about his experiments, um, but all he did was come up with the idea that actually electrons are orbiting the nucleus at specific intervals. So he started coming up with this idea of energy levels, um, and it was adapted after that. But we've got the idea that Bohr was energy levels. So I'm just going to put down energy levels, or you can call them orbits, or you can call them shells. Not a problem at all. Um, and then Chadwick, he was the one that actually discovered neutrons. Now it was quite um, quite difficult to discover neutrons because actually there's no charge to them. Um, and I think what they were actually looking at is this idea that. Um, when they were working out the mass of an atom, we knew that protons had a charge of plus one, um, and we've given them this atomic mass unit of one, but actually if we had atoms with a, um, a mass of say five, uh, but only a charge of plus two, then there must have been other particles that are making up the rest of the mass. So come up with this idea of neutrons, which obviously we've sort of since proven is correct. So. These are quite commonly six mark questions in the exam. So you need to be aware of that and you need to be able to explain actually um, either of these two diagrams here. Uh, how do they explain going from the plum pudding model to the nuclear model? Okay, let's just move that. Let's go that way. Let's move it out of the way. Like I said, I'll, give you, I'll upload this, um, this whole whiteboard I can upload as a PDF to Google Classroom when I'm done. God, you guys are quiet today. Nobody commented at all. <coughs> so let's look at the types of radiation then. If you've got questions, um, this is useful or it's not useful or you've got any ideas, again, drop it in the comments box um, or afterwards put it on Google Classroom. Um, but just so I know that I'm actually not talking to myself, that'd be really good. So we're looking at types of radiation. Now we've already said we've got alpha radiation, which is made of particles. We've got these protons and we have neutrons. And alpha radiation is really big. So this is our sort of biggest form, I suppose. Underneath that, we've got beta and beta is made of a single electron. Now, the bit that confuses a lot of people is nuclear radiation comes from the nucleus, which is why it's called nuclear radiation. But we know that electrons found in energy levels or orbiting. So what we actually end up with is a single neutron breaks apart to give out an electron and a proton. So the proton stays in the nucleus and the electron gets discharged as beta radiation. So this is a bit smaller. Then after that, we've got our gamma radiation and gamma radiation is a wave so it's not a particle, um, and it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, when we fire these out objects, so if we just 
let's just put this in. We've got that one. that one oh come on wake up there we go and I'll do another one here okay so that's lead we've got a few centimeters of aluminium um, and we've got some paper so actually when we're firing these We know that alpha radiation, because it's really big, it's actually stopped by the paper. We know that the beta radiation is stopped by a few centimetres of aluminium. Yet when we're looking at gamma, we're actually looking at lead or concrete in order to stop it. Um, and we know that actually, because if you think about the fact that, alpha radi that gamma radiation is part of our electromagnetic spectrum, um, in the same ways that we can pick up radio waves indoors, uh, it actually can pass through sort of quite a few different objects. So it's worth trying to think about it in those terms. So we're looking at the sort of least penetrating, which is the word we use when we're looking at uh, radiations. We're looking at the least penetratings up here. And this is the most penetrating. Down here. Okay, so that's... Um, in terms of the damage they do though, it's actually reversed. So I'll just shift this over just slightly. When we're looking at the damage they do, then actually alpha radiation is the most ionizing. And by ionizing, what we're talking about is the ability to knock um, atoms apart or knock pieces off of the atoms and turn them into charged particles called ions. Now, we've said that alpha radiation is the biggest, it has the most mass, so it makes sense that it's going to do the most damage when it collides with other atoms. So we're looking at the most ionizing going down to the least ionizing. This doesn't mean that gamma radiation isn't dangerous, we know it is, but it's the least ionizing, um, although we can obviously adjust the intensity as we're working on that one as well. So look at the most ionizing going down to the least ionizing. And again, that's the sort of model you need to know. We need to know what they're made of. Um, we need to know that actually all of these, let's move over for a second, all of these are actually from the nucleus. So make sure that you're actually aware of um, or of how electrons are kicked out from the, from the uh, nucleus in terms of that neutron splitting apart into a proton um, and into a neutron. <coughs> so one of the questions that came up in the sort of recent mock that we did, sorry, one of the uh, questions that came up in the recent mock that we did was this one. So lots and lots of people got this one wrong. Let's just place that there. Now the first thing we should have a look at is because we've got this electron that's being kicked out here, yeah, here, this should be indicating that we're beta radiation. So because we know it's beta radiation from what we've just done, we know that we're going to have this neutron that's going to be converted into a pro, or it's going to break down into a proton, it's going to break down into an electron. The electron is going to leave the atom. Okay? And the proton is going to stay in the nucleus. So because of that, what we're going to see happen is the atomic number is going to increase by one. Okay. Um, so in terms of putting this down here, we're going to have no change at all to the atomic mass. What we are going to find though is this goes up to 58 and that stays at 140. We don't need to look this up in a periodic table, but if we look it up, 58 should be um, this element, okay? So this again, it's one of those areas, it was only, I think it was only one or two marks. I think I've got the, the uh, paper here somewhere. Uh, where is it? Here we go. 
I'll just turn that on for you so you can have a quick look at. There we go. So, two marks, one for getting each of the particles correct. Um, in terms of what the mark scheme shows us, there we go. So, one mark for getting the electron correct, and one mark for getting the correct details on our other element. So it should be a fairly quick one, but just the fact that we've got this electron there um, should be the giveaway straight away with this. Now, not that this element would give out alpha radiation. Let's just move this all up. But if we take the same element, so let's just say we take that again, and let's say that actually it breaks down via alpha radiation this time. So alpha radiation we know is the nucleus of a helium atom. It's got two protons and it's got two neutrons. So in this case, we can work out the numbers before we work out what the element is. So we're going from 140, we're losing four particles. So that's gonna go down to 136. We've got 57 protons and we're losing two protons. So that's gonna go down to 55. So if I then find a periodic table, just bring one up quickly. And I should be able to add this one in here. There we go. We can then go through and we can have a look at that. And we can find out that actually 55 is cesium. <coughs> so we don't need to look at cesium. We don't need to worry that the atomic mass is different. All we need to do is do the calculations, find out which element has the same atomic mass, and then that's the one that we're gonna plug into our results. So if I minimize that, back onto this one, then our answer is going to be cesium. And you can choose any of the elements in the periodic table to practice these. Um, it doesn't even matter really if they're breaking down into alpha or beta, um, as long as we can do the calculations. So if we bring up the periodic table again, we can have a quick look and we can choose one. Um, let's take lead, for so, 52 and it tells us on there that we've got the atomic mass of 208. So if we were to take lead, and we can actually practice doing a couple of these. We just have to double check, yeah, it's 82, 82 not 52. I thought I does it wrong. Um, and we can do sort of various um, breakdowns with this one. So if we do an alpha radiation first of all, so again I'm going to put my helium in there. Um, I'm going to take four, so that's going to take the atomic mass down to 204. I'm losing two off of my atomic number, so that's going to take that down to 80. We come back here and we have a look at 80 is actually going to be mercury. So HG. Let's do it again, just to practice. And this doesn't need to be something that I set, this can just be something that you do. That's gonna take my mass down to 200. And it's gonna take the atomic number down to 78. We can have another look, 78 is platinum. We now have some platinum, it's probably gonna be radioactive at this point. Put my helium in there. Um, and then just for good measure, we can do a beta decay as well. So. There's my beta radiation. We know that the mass isn't changing, but this time the atomic number is going up by one. So that's gonna take it to 79. My mass isn't changing, so that's still gonna be 200. And if we have a look, lo and behold, we've just managed to turn our lead into gold. Okay, so we can turn lead into gold using radioactive and nuclear decay. 
but you can practice with any else. You can take any element. You can practice losing um, helium. You can practice, uh, sorry, practice losing alpha radiation. You can practice lose, uh, losing beta radiation and see what elements you come up to. Um, and I'm more than happy if you want to pra practice those, take a quick picture, put it on Google Classroom. Um, I can have a look and see whether you've done it right or not. But let me know one way or the other with that one. Right, quick swig of coffee. Okay. Have I got those ones all in? Right, so basically what we've just been saying there, let's just bring that down there. I wonder if I can make it any bigger. There, a little bit bigger. So this is what we were going through at the start. Let's just see what you can remember. Have a quick read through this and then we'll see how we're going to answer this. No one's still talking in the comments box. Either there's no one watching me at the moment or everyone is just too sleepy to write. Okay, so, plum pudding model. And we know we've got the nuclear model. Periodic table still on your screen. Ah, thanks for letting me know. Hang on, let me turn that off. There you go. Should be gone now. Sorry about that. Did you get... Cool. Did you get these equations? Or did all of that lost because I left the periodic table up? Good to see you awake though. Brilliant, that's fine. If you've got that bit, I can carry on with this. I'll move this back up. Sorry, it's some new software, so still playing around, still learning it. Cool. Um, okay, so plum pudding model. Straight away, we should be picking out Thompson and we should be picking out Rutherford um, and I'd be doing this in the exam um, or I'd be writing this down I'd be going through I'd be picking out these key pieces annotating the questions writing over it using additional paper if we need to don't be afraid if you ever have to redo any of these um, to make notes on the papers I think too many pe people sometimes are too afraid of making a mess of things and keeping everything really neat and actually it's quite good to be able to organize our thoughts so alpha, let's just sort of see where we go with this one. So we're looking at this sort of alpha scatter. Um, in terms of key points then, we're looking at most pass through. And I haven't really started answering it yet. I'm just trying to get my thoughts organized. And I can turn this into um, a proper answer in a minute. Sum deflected equals positive nucleus. And we're going to put few, I'm going to put reflected. So I've pretty much got all the six marks for that answer if I was going to do that one, um, although I would probably want to just rephrase this. So I'd be putting in here now, let's just change that colour just as you to see. I'd be changing that saying most alpha particles pass through the atom. 
giving it uh, meaning most of the atoms empty space some of the alpha particles are deflected meaning um, a positive nucleus and few of the alpha particles are reflected meaning most of the mass is in a tiny nucleus okay right really weird teaching with no feedback from people um, because normally you sort of play off everybody else around you right I'm gonna bring in again I need that one okay that so we've looked at the history of the atom um, we've started looking at uh, what the atoms are made of. We haven't really spoken about count rates yet. We haven't spoken about Geiger tubes yet. But we've had a look at what they're made of and we've had a look at some of the properties with those. Um, we've just had a look at some of the nuclear equations. And this document, by the way, this is just the specification that the exam board provide. So you can get it on the AQA website. So it's worth having a quick sift through because it's quite a nice way of having a look and going, actually, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that. No, I can't do this bit. Um, and from, from a teaching point of view, it's what we use, it's what we go back to all the time to make sure that actually we know that we've covered all the key bits of information. So next bit they're looking at is half-lives. Um, and then we'll have a look at this idea of contamination and irradiation, because it's another area that a lot of students regularly get confused with, I suppose. So let me get rid of that again. So not being a wally and leaving up on the screen for you. So, half-life for you. God, my writing's getting worse. There's two definitions we can use for half-lives. So we'll put them both down uh, and we'll have a look at how we can use them. Um, I'll put one of the graphs up in a minute that you had uh, on last year's exam paper um, and we can have a look at actually how we can use this idea of half-life to answer questions on it. So the first way of explaining it is the time taken for the count rate or radioactive count rate to decrease by half. Okay, the other definition that we can use, and they're both equally valid because they mean pretty much the same thing, is the time taken. for half the radioactive atoms to decay. So if nothing else, you need to know those. Now, the if we have a look at, uh, get up here. No, further down. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly copy that out. You can't see what I'm doing at the moment, so don't worry too much. Um, I'm just going to drop the graph though. Into here. There we go. No, let's get rid of that. I need to scroll up, otherwise I can't, I'm gonna cover up half my notes. Let's put it there. There we go. So this is your sort of typical half-life graph. In this case, we've got the number of atoms, but that could equally be the count rate um, over on the y-axis. So over here. Um, and we've got time down the bottom. Now, depending on the graph we look at, time can be in seconds, can be in milliseconds. 
um, frequently it's in weeks, days, months, years, decades, um, centuries, depending on what the element is. And that's fine. It just means that we need to make sure that our graph work is fairly good. Oh, I thought was somebody commenting. We just need to make sure that our um, graph work is fairly good. And then we just check the axes before we do anything. Remember that across the sort of six exam papers in science, there's usually at least half a GCSE grade just on being good at graphs. So we need to make sure we've got our heads around that. Now, we shouldn't panic too much when we see these sorts of graphs. I mean, the first thing we want to do is identify actually what's half of where the graph's starting. So the graph's starting on five. So if we go half of that, it's two and a half. Let's see if I can do this, going across to the line. I've done that as an arrow, never mind. And we'll drop that down to 50. <coughs> Most of the graphs in GCSE um, half lives are fairly straightforward. So we can see here that the half life is 50 seconds. Now, if we want to, we can check that. Because if we take half of um, two and a half, so we're looking at 1.25, which is sort of around there somewhere, we should be able to come across, and this is all going to be quite rough. Hang on, not that. Let's undo that. There. And sure enough, our second half-life is at 100. That line's not quite straight, but you can see the point I'm trying to make there. Okay, so this is another 50 seconds. So we can turn around and say that our half-life is going to be 50 seconds on this. So we can start doing quite a few things with this at this point. We can turn around and say, okay, six half-lives. Um, straight away, we know how long it's going to take. Um, though we sometimes get questions on this one about sort of proportions and this should just be fractions should it just be proportions so if they might turn around and say what proportion is going to be left after six half lives so in this case we could turn around and say okay well we know to start with if we're starting off with one after one half life we're gonna have a half quarter eighth what's that so that's one half life that's two half lives three half lives four half-lives and you get the idea so after six half-lives we'd have one over 64th um, of our original starting material uh, we could work out what the count rate is and that's even easier um, we could either just multiply it by so we could multiply five or one over 64 um, or if we hadn't done the calculations we could just go five, divided by two, divided by two, divided by two. We could just work our way down. So half-life calculations pretty much don't get any harder than that. Um, and what I will do is I'll drop some questions on half-lives uh, later on today onto the Google Classroom. So if you want to have a practice at some of those calculations, um, not a problem at all with that. I'll put them on, you can have a bit of a play with them and see what you come up with. Okay. But in terms of half-life, don't try and get too freaked out. They are literally, it's a case of reading a graph um, and keeping it simple. I think most people, because it looks hard, they massively overcomplicate half-lives um, and it shouldn't be that difficult to do. Right, let's move that up. So, contamination versus irradiation. We are, we're irradiated fairly regularly. Um, if you think about the, I, the fact that we've actually got background radiation around us quite a lot, um, in some coffees, you can often get it um, with a decent Geiger counter, bananas. We get background radiation from space. Uh, if you've had an x-ray, you've been irradiated. Now, that just means we've had radiation passing through us. In very high doses or prolonged doses, it can be dangerous. Uh, but generally, we're fairly careful with how much we get. People that work around radiation quite a lot will have protective gear on and they will often wear these badges and the badges will change colour depending on how much radiation they've got so they know how much they've been exposed to. So that's just a radiation, it just means that radiation has passed through us. Okay, so let's put that up here. So it doesn't mean that we've actually become radioactive. Um, 
let's just put contamination down here. So we will often irradiate maybe medical equipment to try and sterilize. Um, we've irradiated food before. Uh, we can actually, there are some devices for sterilizing water, um, all sorts of things. It's normally for sort of sterilization purposes, uh, but in that case, that item has become irradiated, but it doesn't mean it's radioactive anymore. When we're looking at contamination then, contamination means uh, radioactive particles have ended up onto that person so or that object so contamination means radioactive material okay so contamination means the radioactive material is either on the person or it's on the object um, and that person that's still giving out radiation. So we generally look at higher doses of radiation that continuously being irradiated. Um, whereas with irradiation, the radiation seems passed through and that's it, it's done, it's dusted. We don't have to worry about it too much anymore. So it's worth making sure that you're really happy with what those two words mean. Um, it comes up quite a bit. I think there's a couple of mark questions. Uh, was it on this paper? Bear with me just while I have another quick look. Um, it was definitely one of the papers we've looked at recently. It might have been on a previous one. No, no, this one just, this one talks about the radiation, but didn't actually have um, about the, well, I think it must have been last year's one then. It was definitely one I was having a look at. Okay, so moving on to the next bit. We've looked at contamination. So what I think I'll do is we'll talk a little bit about, see we, mainly me at the moment. I might have to make another mistake and put something up in a minute, just have you guys talking to me. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at some of the uses of radiation. Now, the main one for alpha radiation, um, if you've got smoke alarms in your home, and I'm really hoping you all have smoke alarms in your home, especially as we're all staying in home now. Please tell me you're all staying at home at the moment. Um, when we're looking at alpha radiation is in smoke alarms. Ooh. I've got a button on this pen that if you push it, it acts as a speller. Right, so smoke alarms. Now the alpha radiation, because it's charged, actually helps complete the circuit in the detector. So that's constantly sending alpha particles across inside the smoke alarm. It's perfectly safe, um, it's shielded. The Alpha radiation, even if it got outside, which it can't do, is actually absorbed by air really, really quickly. So it's perfectly safe. Um, but because it's so big, it's easily blocked by pretty much anything. So if smoke particles manage to, so we're looking at particle particulates of soot um, and other sort of gases, but mainly soot gets into the smoke alarm, the alpha radiation gets blocked, gets absorbed um, by those particles which means the detector is no longer picking up alpha radiation and it affects the charge inside the detector. So the alarm goes off. So really quite a simple one. So although it's definitely the most dangerous, it's also the one that we're probably most familiar with, um, even if we don't realize it because we definitely have them in all our homes. When we're looking at beta radiation then, so beta radiation we know was more penetrating. We know it is less ionizing um, it can be used in some medical equipment, so we can use it for some limited traces because it's not quite as um, penetrating as gamma. So a little bit more specific, but we want to use it in sort of small doses. So when we're looking at beta radiation, it can be have medical uses. Um, and the other one it can be used for is an industry. So if you look at some of the metal industry where they're rolling out sort of sheets of metal, what you'll do is you'll actually have this sort of metal coming in from a block and you'll have these rollers. And what the rollers are doing is they're just making sure that we've got the correct, um, the correct sort of thickness. So on here, what they'll have is they'll have a beta source 
and they'll have a detector down this side. Now, as the beta radiation is going through, what medical uses can you have? Are you radioactive then, Ryan? Um, so the BDA, uh, beta radiation is going through the metal, getting picked up with the detector. If the beta radiation levels gets too high, then that means the metals become too thin, so the machine will automatically move the rollers apart. If the beta radiation levels get too low, um, that means actually the metals got too thick, so it can move the um, it can move the metal rollers a little bit closer together. Uh, what you talk about? It's okay, right? So you said which medical uses can it have? Are we talking about? Oh, okay. In terms of beta radiation, so we're looking at traces. So it can be used for sort of detecting blockages in the body. It can be used for work, uh, looking at some issues. It will generally either be a beta or a gamma source on that one, but gamma can be a little bit um, penetrating. So sometimes it can be quite difficult to actually try and work out exactly where a blockage is. You can imagine if you're trying to work out um, maybe in the heart, if you're trying to work out the sort of blood vessels and where a blockage might be in very, very small capillaries, um, or if we're looking at sort of other parts of the body, then what we generally want to do is we will inject a medical tracer, which has got a, a, which is a radioactive source. They will let it spread through the body, and then they'll use an X-ray or a scanning. Um, uh, I think maybe not a CAT scan, usually an X-ray, and they'll photograph the body. And then actually, what they can do is they can work around where the tracer stops is where the blockage is going to be. So in terms of a medical use, it's often as a medical tracer, if that makes sense. But yeah, good question. Thank you. Somebody is awake. So yeah, beta source detector in industry. Um, gamma, so we can use it for sterilizing equipment. So again, in hospitals, they can often use it. They will generally not they use things like autoclaves, but we can use it for sterilizing equipment. We can use it for sterilizing food. We can use it for sterilizing water because it's very, very penetrating and it doesn't contaminate, it only irradiates. So we've got that one. Uh, again, we've got the medical uses. So it traces definitely. We're also looking at radiotherapy with gamma. So if you can imagine if we've got technical drawing coming up, let's just say someone has got um, cancer of some sort. Let's just change that and change that um, what they'll do is because what you don't want to do is shine gamma radiation at intensity that's going to kill the cells you only want to kill specific cells so what they'll do is they will actually shine multiple beams through okay and this bit Where they cross over, that's the only point where the intensity of the gamma radiation is going to be um, high enough to actually kill the cells. So what they'll do is they'll actually identify exactly where those cells are. Um, they'll work out how to shine the beams through, and they spend quite a bit of time working this one out. And they'll fire multiple beams of gamma radiation through the person, and it's only at the crossover point that where the intensity is going to be high enough to actually kill the cells off. Um, so each beam on its own won't do that one. Uh, they've also used it for sort of trying to find leaks in pipes. So you can imagine if we've got, let's just say we've got some ground um, and we've got this under sort of pipe underground and it's leaking. Now, if we're not, we know there's a leak, but we're not entirely sure where it is. What we don't want to have to do is dig up the entire pipeline. So what they can do is they'll put a, well, they'll put a gamma source in, which will work its way down the pipe. Now, that gamma source will leak into the ground more where the leak is. Okay, Terry. Um, no, they can't become contaminated because um, when we're looking at gamma radiation, we're not actually leaving any particles in the person. We're just literally using waves. So the waves pass through, so they're becoming irradiated, but they're not becoming contaminated. So yeah, good question on that one. But no, it's um, it's perfectly safe from that point of view, um, just not for the cells where the crossover point's gonna be. 
Uh, yeah, okay, so we've got a person walking along here with some form of Geiger detector. Let's just do it like a metal detector. They'll walk along and wherever it picks up um, large amounts of radioactive source, that's gonna be where the leak is and that's where they're gonna have to dig down. Okay, so that's how you would use gamma radiation on this one. Cool, that's most of physics four covered. Now, let's have a quick look at this. Yeah, I'll copy these notes out in a minute and get those sorted for you. Right, anyone got any questions? Any comments? Has that helped some of you? Um, very few uses, Ben. So neutron radiation. Um, okay, I'll come back to you in a minute, Terry, with Ben. Um, in terms of GCSC, not entirely sure. I don't think neutron radiation um, has many uses. Neutron radiation often comes up when we're looking at nuclear fission and fusion, uh, which is triple science. Sorry, I'm looking at that screen. I know the camera's over here. So we can fire neutrons in and we get neutrons given out rather than breaking down. So Ben, from when we're looking at neutron, we are generally looking at nuclear fission, which is where atoms split apart, which is what they use in uh, nuclear power stations. Um, I will ju I'll just cover that very quickly. So let's just move over here for a minute. So I've got a bit of space. So if we've got let's say we've got an atom, um, it'll be probably one of the isotopes of uranium that we're using at the moment. Um, or they did read some research recently that they've apparently you can use cobalt in nuclear power stations um, which is more plentiful doesn't leave very much in the way of waste and is actually safer but I'm not entirely sure why they don't use it so if you fire a single neutron good question Poppy I'll be with you at that one in a moment uh, if we fire a neutron in what it does is it causes the nucleus of the atom to become unstable and it breaks apart so it breaks apart into two smaller atoms. And in this case, it actually gives off three more neutrons. Now, if you think about this, each one of those can hit another uranium atom. Okay, so each one of those is gonna break down and give off And you get the idea, I'm not gonna go any further than this one um, because I'll run out of space. Okay, but this is called a chain reaction. So, so yeah, Ben, with, ne with neutron radiation, we're firing the neutron in, we're causing an atom to split, we get neutrons given out, three come out for every one that goes in and rapidly we end up with this massive chain reaction because we end up with vast amounts of energy that's being given out. until the whole thing explodes. So with a power station, what they'll do is they'll use uh, control rods, usually made out of boron, to absorb some of those neutrons uh, to avoid going into uh, a chain reaction for this one. But it's exactly the same way, all that energy is used in a nuclear power station to heat water. And very slight tangent, but this does actually come up um, in, I think the chemistry exams with this one. So that energy would be used to heat water. So, I've got a tank of water here. Um, out the top of that, we're gonna be making steam and exactly the same way that a coal power station works, that steam is gonna turn a big turbine and on the end of that is we're gonna have a generator. So, we would have, let's just do change color again, that'll do. Okay, so a steam turbine generator on that one. So the nuclear power can be used for that one. Um, right, Terry. Um, 
The difference between beta and gamma when we're looking at medical uses, it depends on the sort of blockage, where it is, and the uh, the amount of so if you think about the fact that gamma is very very penetrating so sometimes it can pretty much flood everywhere and it's very difficult to see where a blockage is whereas with beta what you can you can actually try and uh, see individual i suppose blood vessels you can actually break things down you can see it very much smaller the problem is beta is a bit more ionizing um the other thing that's well worth being aware of when we're looking at this is we have to choose the half life for medical traces really carefully because generally what you want is you want a half-life that is long enough to be able to photograph the person, but short enough that once you've injected it into, into them, it's going to lose its radioactivity very, very quickly, so they're no longer contaminated. Because with a medical tracer, you are actually contaminating the person because you want them to be given off radiation in order to be picked up by a camera. Um, but you don't want them then to be walking out of the hospital and walking around still pumping out radiation. Um, one, it's dangerous for others, but it's also dangerous for themselves. So you choose the tracer based on where the blockage might be um, and also the half-life that goes with it. Um, okay, Poppy, in terms of the work, we haven't had, we haven't been told officially yet exactly what evidence they're going to use. From my understanding and conversations with Mr. Booth, what we're looking at is it will be a combination of mock results, past data, um, and the work that we're getting you to do now. Obviously what the exam boards have also said though is if you're not happy with the results you get, um, they're looking at putting on exams after the summer holidays so people can then sit their exams then and, and redo them if you want to. So we will obviously come up with the predictions based on the evidence we've got, which is why we're continuing the work now. Um, but then if you get them and go, actually I needed better than that or I'm not happy with that, there'll be the option to still sit the exam September, October, uh, whenever we're back, whenever this sort of ends. That's the plans as I see it at the moment, which is why it's worth staying on top of things, um, at least until you get your results. Although I think the DfE have said they're aiming to get all of the results to students by, I think they said the end of July, which is even earlier than you would normally get them. So watch this space. As I know more, I will let you guys know. Any other questions on this? or anything else while I'm here. Everyone's gone really quiet. So while we're here, um, have our last, yeah, all your papers have been marked, Jude. Um, I will, rather than putting them out on a public forum and then giving you everybody's results, uh, one of my plans later today will be to email each person with individual results. Um, bearing in mind, obviously, we've got quite a few things to take into account when we're looking at predicted grades. So we will have a look at that later on. Uh, yeah, Poppy, I mean, the, what it's looking at at the moment is that the we're going to be asked to give our predicted grades based on the evidence that we've got, which will be your exam results. Now, we, again, we don't know what evidence they're going to ask for. We don't know how it's going to be moderated. And we don't know anything else on that one. Um, all we've been told is it will be based on teacher judgment. Has this format for a lesson worked for you guys? Any comments, questions, issues, suggestions with this? Um, do you want me to do more of them? Brilliant. Okay. Um, I'll let you know because I was looking at doing some for year 10 as well. Uh, what I'll probably do is, because he attends also GCSE, I'll let you know when I'm going to do those ones. Um, so you can join in with the year 10 ones as well. Um, I haven't given them access to the, or given them the link for this one yet because they haven't done a lot of the content for it. But it's um, brilliant. If that works well, I'll do some more of these. Fantastic. Um, are you happy with sort of 10 o'clock in the morning being a good enough time for you guys?
Okay, the video, well, the video is going to stay on my channel, so that will stay live, uh, stay on there. Um, uh, Mia will email you. She says she can't comment. Oh, okay, not a problem at all. I do have the Google Classroom open, so she can always comment on there if need be. Uh, so yeah, we'll carry on with this one, and I will. Um, I'll keep an eye on Google Classroom because any news I'll put in there. Uh, but like I said, this will stay live on my channel. So, well not live, but it will stay on my channel. So let me know if you've got any issues there. And I will put a copy of the whiteboard into Google Classroom in the next few minutes so that you guys can pick up on it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. And I will catch up in the next day or two. Take care.